All right. So it's always fun to come back home. I'm a, I'm a homeboy. So we, we got Anna. We got Anna to the airport, and then guess what we did? We had a date. We went to the what's it call it place? A corral. It's something to do with food. I mean, the place was almost sinful. You could, you could just overeat so easily, in which I did. Huh. How many been there? Yeah, well, there you go. It's, it's, I mean, they'll, they'll fry a steak and ask you, oh, medium rare, well done. That's just part of it. I mean, aren't we blessed? Too blessed sometimes. Let's not forget how blessed we are. We're blessed because of Jesus Christ. And he loves all people. God so loved the world. God cares about people that hate him. God will ultimately be in control. Now, I'm, I'm just an ordinary man, as one of my friends said, who served in Philippines for most of his entire life as a missionary. And he was here a few seasons ago and said those words, I'm just an ordinary man that serves an extraordinary God. And that is, the, that is so true. And over and over in Scripture we find how Israel was faced, uh, they were facing the enemy. And then when they were facing the enemy, they, they got serious about God. Many times they looked to God, and God thwarted the enemy, confused the enemy. Because God intervened, because God chose Israel. But he also chose you and I through Jesus. We have been adopted. Romans describes that whole scenario of adoption because Israel was chosen but now we also can become his sons and daughters. God is in control knowing all these things before he even created mankind which blows me away. Why would you bother God? But God is God of love also a God of just and judgment. He will judge sin. He always has always will but we can stand complete before him because Jesus took our sin. So the book of Hebrews has been describing, lifting up the name of Jesus, lifting up the person, the God of Jesus, Jesus being God. In the beginning, he was with God. John's gospel. In the beginning, what a beginning of what? It's time as we know it. As Jesus has always been. And so now we're now we're getting to the 12th chapter, we're getting to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. We've been kind of just making our way chapter by chapter. We're not covering every verse, but most of them we're getting the connection going here. We just left, we just talked about Hebrews chapter 11. It was talking about the faith of so many people. You know, I'm talking about the big names. I like to talk about the big names, but there's a little verse in there tucked away in the end of the book of Hebrews 11. It says, Verse 36, and others, and others. I came up in our devotional time in the basement this morning. Someone said, I want to meet all the people that were in the Bible or something to that degree. I want to talk to them all. And there are many people whose names are not necessarily recorded in Scripture. Or not, or they're, they're not making a big splash, so to speak. But God notices those people. And God notices the humbleness of people's heart. You can live in the backside of a desert, and God can find you. Hallelujah. You can be in a faraway place, and God can choose to find you because he knows where you're at. And he cares about you. 
So now by the time we get to Hebrews 12, 1, our writer, we don't know per se who the author of Hebrews is, although I have figured it out. It is God himself. Because all scriptures is Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, our title is a race to run. It's not a race to, to come in first place. It's not a race about getting some kind of acknowledgement. Oh, I, I outran everyone else. But it's a race that we are going to finish the line. We're going to come across the finishing line because of Jesus is waiting there for you. And all the people that have gone before us, I can't imagine that all heaven rejoices when there's one. The Bible says when there's one that repents, the whole works in heaven have a party. The angels at least do. I cannot help but imagine some of the people in heaven also that know these people. Maybe their loved ones also celebrate with the angels. So therefore, since we have a great, great cloud of witnesses, what, what is he talking? He's referring to the people we just talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. But I also want you to think about loved ones who maybe have been in your life that have impacted your, your life in some good way, in a positive way in your faith. And it's helped you shape your faith. I believe we can include them. Why can we run this race? Because it is a race that God has called us to. It is a race, we can call it a race of life. A race meaning we are on this life. It is sometimes likened to a rat race. If you know what I'm talking about. We're, we're going every direction. And somehow with the help of God, we've got to find balance where we're focusing on what is it that the Lord has called you and I to be. Let's read the verse. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I've told this story a hundred times, but since you just maybe haven't heard it, back in my young days, we had youth, uh, what do you call them, youth rallies. It was a sectional meaning. I was from Aiken, so people from Brainerd, Crosby, and on around, Hilliger. We all, uh, someone came up with the idea, let's have a youth, um, we'll call it uh, Olympics. Olympics. Remember that, Linda? And we, we were over in Brainerd, and we were by a racetrack, and so I don't know how I got involved with the race, but I... First thing you knew, I, I was going to run this race. And so I, I didn't have, I had probably work boots on, you know, the old, the old Red Wings. They got to go. I mean, seriously. So I ran on my socks. Oh, boy. And, you know, if, if you know the racetracks, like, I don't even know what they call it, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a, Blackish, rubberish, textures. I think the water goes through it, but oh, I could feel my skin being coming tender every corner. But I didn't care. I'm going to win this race. I don't think I won the race. I think I just did okay, but I suffered after the race. You know. <laughs> what is the Lord saying? In this life with him, there are only a few things that are necessary. I mean, he, came, he came right down to it. Food and clothing, covering. And having a heart for him. Oh, isn't there so many things that can distract us? Make us upset if, they, if you let them. Make us become kind of bogged down. Come we we got to get we got to get rid of the things and and when he deals with sin the best way to deal with sin is to acknowledge it we we, we just learned or we're reminded first john 1 9 right if you confess your sin he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you isn't that a great promise if you say you have no sin what what does it say if you say you have no sin 
you, you make, it's almost like you're saying, God, God isn't telling the truth. Let me find it. I'm going to find it. I've got to find it. I'm going the wrong way. No, I'm going the right way. Here it is. Here it is. I didn't put this one in my notes, but here it is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. That's huge. That's, if we say that we have, and his word is not in us, what, what he's saying is there, there, there's, a, there's a need for us to just confess it. Don't try to hide it. That, that's, what, that's what God, then God says, oh, you hide it. I, I know it anyway, but because you don't acknowledge, I can't do it. I'm not going to. I'm not going to take it away until you say yes. Okay, so we get rid of the sin by confessing and saying yes. And we can have a clean heart. We can have a new beginning. Isn't that great news? You can start your day anew with fresh. Did you know that the Bible says there's new mercies every morning? There's new, fresh mercy. So if we're going to run this race, we have to, verse 2 tells us how to run it. Besides verse 1, we run with endurance. We have to find that pace that works for us. That God wants you to run in a certain pace. I believe that there are different paces that everyone's going to have. You know, not everyone's the same, thank the Lord. We're not all cookie cutter Christians. God gifted you with other things. I'm not a tech guy, Austin is. So we need one another. So, verse 2, our first point, fixing your eyes upon Jesus. If we're going to run well, if we're going to stay in the race, if we're going to finish the course, if we're going to keep enduring, fix your eyes on him. Consider him who has endured. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of faith. You mean to tell me, he perfected faith? He's the author of faith? What do you mean for the joy set before him endured the cross? There's nothing joyful about the cross. But only that's on the other side of the cross. Seeing past the cross. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. His death completed that which was missing so that we could have relationship with God. He finished the work that you and I could not do. And therefore, if I fix my eyes on Jesus, he's going to take me across the finish line. I'm going to keep looking to Jesus. He's going to be with me in the morning. He's going to be with me in the noontime. He's going to be with you on your workplace or in your workshop or at your workbench or when you go to and fro and when you go in faraway places or near away places, wherever it may be, the Lord says, I will be with you. And that's a promise that's coming in the next chapter. We'll get into that later. I will be with you always. But we have to be intentional. We have to call upon the Lord. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. When I begin to sink, and at times I begin to sink and feel overwhelmed, have you ever had those moments? No. Yes. How many had a few this morning even? Oh, we're not going there. Yeah, one, one honest person. It doesn't mean that you have to have always problems. There's all these things. But throughout the course of your life, you can probably look back and say, wow, that was a tough goal. That was a tough season. That was a test of my faith. And we talked a little bit about testing. Jesus, God the Father, tests us. But fixing our eyes on Jesus, because he is the greatest example, don't get in the trap of comparing yourself to someone else. Come on. Now, we ought to be able to look up, a look up to one another. If, our, if we're walking with Jesus, that's a different. That we're encouraging one another. We're looking up to one another. But ultimately, Jesus is our aim. Jesus is our example. He is our soon-returning king. 
You see, when we're fixing eyes on Jesus, we're not so taken off balance by the current events of the world. We don't just dwell on the things that are happening on the earth, but we're thinking heaven is about to open. Heaven is about to blow the trumpets. Heaven is about to come. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It is ought to be, as Paul described, this, this is a day that we are taken out of this suffering. It was good news to the Thessalonians. They were in persecution, and then they heard the, the refreshing words about Jesus coming for his church and the dead in Christ coming out of the ground, being brought into heaven, reunited. That's, that's the thinking in Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since a greater cloud of witnesses, if you could just see his face, a glimpse of Jesus, even now visibly see him, I don't know very many people that have. In fact, I don't know if anybody really that has visibly seen Jesus. I know some that have dreams, some that have visions. But by faith, by faith, we used to sing the old song, sweet by and by. By faith, I see it afar. By faith, every person in the book of Hebrews is by faith. In fact, as the word of God said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. What was it about the disciples that were hiding out after the resurrection of Jesus? They were hiding in a room, fearing for their lives. And one of those disciples, and you know who he was, the one that doubted, remember his name? Thomas. Jesus loved Thomas. But Thomas wasn't convinced. And he said it. I'm not convinced until I touch his, touch him and put my fingers in the imprints. And what happened? Jesus shows up. And he says, Thomas, come on. Here I am. And what did Thomas do? He fell before him and believed. And what did Jesus say? Blessed are those who haven't seen me yet they believe. Blessed those, it's like he's seen yet those who are still yet to come, who have not not going to see me, but they're going to believe. Blessed are them as well. What our world needs is the vision of Jesus. What our world needs right now, the vision, of, the the vision comes through the church, you and I, believers. The person of Jesus must be demonstrated to your neighbor how you treat your neighbor. Why is, why is that so important? God said, love me first, and love your neighbor second. That's two greatest commandments, right? If we love God, how can you, as verse John, I'm getting ahead now, I'm getting into Vern's study here. How can you say you love God, you hate your brother? That's going to all come up in First John. There's a relationship with God that is in such a way that it, it, it begins to show who the person of Jesus. How many said or heard this phrase somewhere in your life? You, you may be the, or they may be the only Bible they will ever read. You've heard that? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. What is that saying? May people see Jesus in us. And so as you're fixing your eyes on Jesus, you're also helping set the pace, encouraging one another on. Fathers, Grandfathers, grandmothers, grandmothers, people in general. It's always someone looking and watching you. It's a whole host of people. Maybe, maybe there's some people you don't even know, but they're recognizing they're different. They're, they think they believe in God. And you get to be a light through him. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. See, Satan wants to blow your light out. Right? You used to sing that song, remember? Don't let Satan blow it out, right? Remember, Jackie? You led a lot of kids in your lifetime. You know all them songs. 
Don't let Satan blow it out. That's the distraction of the enemy. Stop. He can get you to stop singing your song. He can get you to stop rejoicing. He can get you to stop praying. He can get you to stop believing. Get to start doubting a little bit. Start feeling, ah, I'm worthless. I'm no good. I don't know why I'm around anymore. That, that all these things can start to turn in our spirit. That, that we got to fix our eyes on Jesus. Who said, you are worth it. I've di- I died for you. My blood was shed for you. Colossians chapter 3, there's a couple, three verses. Powerful verses that Paul wrote to the church of Colossians. If you have been raised up with Christ, what does that mean? You believe? You come out of the death thing that Paul described when before you become the Christ, you were dead in sins and trespasses. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above. Isn't our mind a powerful thing? Set your mind on the things above. What is it that it's above? Not on the things that are on earth. Well, you know we're on the earth. But we know this is not our real home, is it? That we're actually just passing through for you have died. What do you mean you've died? You died when you came to Jesus, recognized that this old sinful nature must die. Die to myself. Die to the nature of sin. And accepting Jesus. Set your mind on the things above. There's a lot of things happening in heaven. There's a whole lot we don't even know about that's happening in heaven. I believe it's going to be the place where you, you will never want to come back to this, necessarily come back to this. I believe it's hallelujah. This is people who have had out of a body experiences mo- that, that, that I've ever heard. None of them ever said, I, don't, I didn't want to go there. They all said, I, I didn't want to come back. I want to stay in the presence of God. It's a great place. And so these things are, where you have, you have died, you're hidden with Christ. In God, this is the same verse, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Amazing. You're going to stand with him. This whole focus thing is so huge that I have found myself over and over again, the things that I think on, The projects that I try to figure out, I'll get them done eventually if I keep thinking about them. But I have a cabin that I've kind of just, mm, it doesn't seem to be priority right now. So it's not quite finished. And it's been several years. Sometimes it bothers me and probably should. But I'm thinking, what's really more important? I've got to make time for my Lord. I need to have time with my families, family, people. And I've got to keep balance. Parents with young children, some of you remember, How did you make it through those days? While you were younger, that might have helped. But by God's grace, you kept at it. You kept going. Maybe there was days when your children were sick. You were there to help comfort, to help nurture. Maybe there's times where you feel, well, I'm going to run this race, but at the same time, I'm going to look over this a little bit and observe who else is running or trying to race, run on this race. They may have fallen. They may have stumbled. See, this race is not about coming in first place. This race is about bringing others with you. This race is about encouraging one another on. This race is about helping someone get started again, helping someone rebuild 
the walls that have been crumbling in their life. The foundation has been eaten away. This race is about bringing people to Jesus. Second point, faint not. Faint not. Coming from verse 5. Hebrews 12, verse 5. I want to start at verse 3 there, if you find that. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. People drop out of the race because they become weary and lose heart. Discouragement sets in. And they feel like, what's the use? I can't lift my foot again and make one more stride. But then something happens, and they get away in the presence of the Lord. Or another person that's running the race comes by and begins to extend a helping, caring, loving voice and speaks into your life. And you begin to run again. And here's a verse that I'm sure I don't totally understand at all. Verse 4, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, particularly the Psalms and the Proverbs. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. You ever fainted? You tell me that. You fainted? <laughs> you ever feel faint? Uh, can I tell a little story? I never fainted that I, that I know of. But there was this man in our church, a young man at the time, during his uh, sister's wedding. He tipped over like a tree. The, the place was packed. I'm serious. The place was packed. It was probably some of the oxygen was lacking or something. And I remember he started going like this. He was standing there, and he just went over, and, I'm, and boom! And everybody went, oh, my, is he dead? You know, is he dead? That's what we were thinking. Did he die? Hmm. Faint not. Somewhere someone said, well, getting older is not for the faint or the weak. Is that, is that a saying? Uh, we've got to stay in this thing. We've got to, we've got to press on, press in. We, we've got to finish this. Let's not give up. We're, we're almost there. Jesus is coming. Let's finish strong. That's one of my personal goals. Let's finish well. Let's, let's keep the faith. May it be said of us, like it was in our dear brother, Fred Godwell, Terry's my wife, would be her great uncle, ministered so humbly all his life. What did it say in his headstone? Then elevated or promoted. That's the word, promoted. Promoted. When he passed, he was promoted to Jesus. Can we see the bigger picture? Sometimes I get bogged down in all the little things of this life. They're just little things, but they're big to us. They can be, you get us to work up so we can just forget who we're really dealing with. Don't get over, you know, Mike and I, we, we, we work together. And he, he, he teased me, there's too much hollering on the job. You know, the snake guys are the worst scenarios and hollering. And so I started hollering just to kid them, you know. Mud, you know, come on. <laughs> you know, it's not for the faint. 
concrete words, not for the faith for sure. And, you know, and in the spiritual realm, we, we've got to pick up the pace, so to speak, sometimes. <laughs> Stir up the gift of God, Paul said to Timothy. We're getting into firewood season. Oh, I get all kinds of thoughts watching a fire. You know. Stir up the gift. Stir up the coals on the heart. And lastly, besides not fainting, freedom. Verse, oh, I'm going to skip a little bit. The whole thing about God's discipline is not that he's beating you up. I want to finish this. Oh, God must be mad at me. He doesn't like me. I must have done something wrong. God isn't a God that stops loving you. He's a heavenly Father. Here's the, here's the answer. Hebrews 12. Verse 10, he talked about the early earthly fathers disciplining us in verse 9. And then the, half, the last half of verse 10, he says, but, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. Why does God discipline you and I? Because he wants to bring you to a better place. He doesn't want you to miss out what he has for you. He wants you to live above the temptations of the world. He wants to bring you into a place where you are able to war off by the Spirit of God, the enemy, the tents, the fiery darts. He wants to shield you. He wants to share with you his intimacy heart. He wants to talk to you and I personally. All that discipline, verse 11, is not very fun. But the writer says it's for a moment. Momentary affliction. Paul describes it. This life is a moment. Trials are but a moment. You see, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. We've heard that. We've sang that. You see, after we've been trained by him, God doesn't beat us up, he disciplines. He, that means he brings us into order so that we can walk with him better. We can hear from him better. And he brings us to, to a place where we can share one with another. Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And then we go on to the third point, freedom. 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 What? Freedom from what? Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from bitterness. We're going to read about that. Verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. We think about those verses. I think about what I think about is I don't, I'm not as... Um, things bother me as they didn't years ago on the ground, I'm talking about on the ground, stumbling on something, like a little rock, a uh, piece of wood. Are you there yet? Has that ever happened to you? And so you got to get the, get the stuff, clear, clear the stuff out of the way, right? Have, are, are you there yet? And so you, you got to protect these knees. you gotta, you, you, you got to make straight paths. <laughs> Does this make sense? I mean, it's just, God is God of, he's reasonable, isn't he? He's reasonable. And if there's things in our life that, and he gets right to it. Like bitterness. Oh, that'll trip you up. That'll bog you down. That'll put a weight on your neck and back trying to run a race with bitterness. That won't free you. You've got to get rid with the help of the Lord. And I know things are hard sometimes to work through, but keep bringing it to Jesus. 
It all comes back to the little word called surrender. Strength in the hands that are weak. God knows your abilities. There isn't a whole lot sometimes, is there? But we're still called to be instruments. We're still called to be vessels. Earthen clay vessels. What? Described in another place. Simply, easily broken. Legs can be broken. Hearts can be broken. Things can creep in that begin to wear us down. Forgiveness really is a gift from God. And the freedom will only come with the help of God helping us to forgive those who may have hurt us. Only by the grace of God. And this is where I wanted wanted to leap over now to Hebrew, uh, not he- Hebrew, it's Romans, to collect some more thoughts. And I had that all marked, and it went away. But Hebrews chapter 12, I'm sure you've read these verses somewhere, sometime, possibly. These verses have helped me put in perspective. I'm just going to Dive in at Romans 12. Begin at verse 14, please. I'm kind of running out of time. Bless those who persecute. Oh, really? Well, that sounds a little like Jesus, doesn't it? Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He says, bless them and curse not. Huge. Because I have the choice to bless people or curse people. If I want to be free in the spirit, I need to bless people with the help of the Lord. Read on. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Well, now, they're duly been blessed, and why, God, wouldn't you send a little that this way? No. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And then he says, weep with those who weep. In other words, don't say, well, get over it. Acknowledge their feelings. Bear one another's burdens. Weep. Empathy, not sympathy. Empathy. Feel with them. Pray together. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the Lord. Treating people with respect no matter what their background. Don't be wise in your own estimation. These are powerful truths. Never pay back evil, verse 17, for evil to anyone. Oh boy, you'd like to just, they got it coming. But God has a better way. Now verse 18, this is the clincher. This set me free. It set me free many times, if possible. If possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. If possible. And this, what, it, what it's saying is you've done all you can do. You've let it go. You've forgiven. But now that other person may, may be hanging on still struggling. And you're like, I can't do anything. What do you do at that point? You say, Lord, by your grace, help me to do what I'm supposed to do. You take care. You work. 
And you give them the space, you turn them unto the Lord. You pray for them. You continue to show unconditional love. Sometimes there's a need to set boundaries. There's a whole, it's a whole different scenario. Sometimes people that hurt you over and over go, you need to say, that's enough. I'm going to protect them. If possible, see that little phrase, if possible. The only way it's going to be possible then is God. Because all things are possible with God. But God can't, and he chooses not to work until the pride comes down. See, see how it works? God is looking for humility. Acknowledging your need. And so it's, this, is, this, is, this is like, Christianity 101. This is basic stuff, isn't it? But we can never lose sight. This is where we live. If possible. I don't want to have enemies. I don't want to say, well, they're my enemy. I, and if I have enemies, maybe I don't even know it. I'm going to pray for him. Pray for those. Not everyone's going to accept your faith. Not everyone's going to be convinced. You keep running the race. But that's what you do. That's what God's called me to do. I'm going to stay in the race. I'm not going to give it up until I finish the cross, the line, if possible. Never take back again to Romans 12. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, leave room for the wrath of God. It's like he's saying, let me work. Let me work. Let me do the work. I can only change the heart. I can only bring people into a, a wanting of me. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Didn't Jesus say, when I leave, I will send the helper, and the helper will convict the world of sin and convince people of truth. And it says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It just ties right in with the Hebrews. Guarding your heart so that you can run with freedom. Remember when you were a young kid and you just run like crazy? Can you remember that part? That was, was just, I can't run anymore. Not like that. It hurts to run like that. Right? But you set your pace. Whatever pace God has called you to, to stay on. And so, to bring it all together, this race is to be run with Jesus by your side. You believe that? I'm going to go switch mic, guys. This race is not to be run alone. Praise God. Brothers and sisters, I can almost see them arm in arm, moving together. One voice. Is this mic on? Yeah, they're working on it. One voice, one heart, one God. One Jesus, one Holy Spirit. We're making a cross. And we'll be worth it all. I want to sing a song because it emphasizes our eyes upon Jesus. Good listeners today, take me there. And we're all in this together. Just open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let me have a fresh vision of Jesus standing there and being with us, running together.